In this video, I want to talk about strange secular historian accounts. I'm going to use two very popular books from ancient history that are secular books. They're not mythical books. They're not religious books. These are books that people took as fact back in these days. First, I want to talk about Herodotus in book four, and then I want to talk about Pliny the Elder. Herodotus talks about the Isidines and the Hyperboreans, the two Scythian tribes. And what's so striking about this is it's so insane, it's mythicized, but it's also verified by other historians back in this time. It would be like two PhD scientists agreeing that the moon is a hologram. Like that's how, that's how crazy this would be back then. So let's get into the text. Book 4, Section 26 The Isidines are said to observe the following custom. Whenever a man's father dies, all his relatives bring their flocks and sacrifice them. Next, they chop up the animals and the body of the father, mix all the meat together, and then send it all out for a feast. After having plucked the hair from the father's head, they clean it, gild it, and therefore treat it as a precious image, to which they offer lavish sacrifices annually. Indeed, sons have performed this rite for their fathers, just as the Hellens have their annual ritual commemorating the birthday of the dead. In other respects, these people are said to be civilized and righteous, and their women share power equally with their men. While the Isodones themselves are well known, we must rely on what they tell us for our knowledge of what lies beyond them, the one-eyed men and the gold-guarding griffins. It is from the Isodones that the Scythians have received their account. The rest of us, because we have heard it from Scythians, customarily call those people Aram Sapiens, which is a Scythian word for the Scythians' words Arama, meaning one, and Spau, meaning eye, one eye. The entire land I am describing experiences harsh winters. For eight, eight months, the frost is intolerable, and you could not create mud by pouring water on the ground unless you light a fire. The sea freezes over, as does the Cimmerian Bosporus, and the Scythians who live within the trench conduct expeditions over the ice, driving their wagons across the land of the Sindhi. Winter continues like this for eight months, and the remaining four months of the year are cold here too. But the winter differs from winters in all other regions, and that during the season, here there is no appreciable rainfall, while in summer it never stops raining, and at this time the thunder occurs elsewhere, it does not happen here but it is frequent in the summer. The th thunder does not occur during the winter. The Scythians regard it with amazement and consider it important, as they do also in the event of an earthquake, no matter what they occur in the summer or winter. While horses can tolerate the Scythian winter, mules and donkeys cannot bear it here. Although elsewhere, horses standing on ice suffer frostbite on their legs, whereas mules and donkeys are able to tolerate it. I think this is why the oxen here do not grow horns, and there is a verse in Homer's Odyssey that supports my opinion. Quote, in Libya, where lambs grow horns straight away from birth, end quote. The statement is correct that horns do grow quickly in hot climates. While in extremely cold climates, cattle either do not grow horns at all, or just barely grow them. Those are effects of cold and Scythia. But I find it amazing since from the beginning of my account I have sought out additional information that no mules can be born in the land of Ellis. Although the climate there is not cold, there is no other obvious reason for this. The aliens themselves say that it is because of a curse, that no mules are born in their land. 
So whenever mating season approaches, they drive out their mares in a ne neighboring territory, where the mares then go to the male donkeys, and after becoming pregnant, are driven back again. Now here's my opinion concerning the feathers that the Scythians say fill up the air and obstruct both visibility and travel through the country. In the upper region of the land, snow falls continually, although as it reasonable to expect, less in the summer and more in the winter. Whoever has observed heavy snowfall knows what I mean when I say the snow resembles feathers, and so I think the Scythians are surrounded, and surrounding peoples describe the snow as feathers, because they note similarly between the two. It is because the winters there are so severe that in far northern regions of this land are uninhabitable. That then is the fullest account that I can give about these matters. But about the Hyperboreans, Neither the Scythians nor any of the inhabitants of this region have anything to say, except perhaps for the Isodons, but I suppose they had say nothing about them early either, since if they did, the Scythians would repeat it, just as the Isodons account of one-eyed men. The Hyperboreans are mentioned by Hesiod and also by Homer in the Epogonia, if Homer actually did compose these verses. The Delions have by far the most to say about them. They tell about the Hyperboreans sent sacred offerings about in stalks of wheat to Scythia. And these offerings are received in succession by each neighboring country until they are brought as far west as the Adriatic Sea. From there they are sent southward and first to the Hellens to receive them are the people of Dodona who send them to the Melian Gulf. Then they cross over to Euboa where one city sends them to the next till they reach Charistos. The Charistians take them to Tenos, passing by Andros, and the Tenians bring them to Delos. That is how it is said the sacred objects come to Delos. But initially the Hyperboreans sent two girls to carry the offerings. Their names, according to the Delions, were Hyperoch and Ladyoch. The Hyperboreans also sent along with them an escort of five of the men for their safety. These men are now called Periphries, and are granted high honors on Delos. But the girls and men sent by the Hyperboreans did not return home again, and the Hyperboreans, perturbed and afraid that they could continue to send others, they would never get them back again either. Wrapped their offerings in, in stalks of wheat, took them to the borders of their land and laid a strict obligation upon the neighbors to send them to get the next people. They say in this way the offerings are sent forth and finally arrive at Delos. I myself know of a practice similar to this performed by Thracian and Paeonian women. Whenever they sacrifice the royal Artemis, they never fail to include an offering of wheat stock. I know that the Thracian and Paeonian women do this, but at Delos, the girls and boys cut their hair in honor of the Hyperborean virgins who died there. Before marriage, the girls cut off a lock of their hair, wind it around a spindle, and place it on the tome. The tome is located within the sanctuary of Artemis, to the left of the entrance, and has an olive tree growing over it. All the boys, too, wind of their hair around a plant, shoot and set it on the tome. Those are the honors of the inhabitants of Delos, give to these maidens. But the Delians say that before the time of Hyperoch and Ladio, other Hyperborean maidens, Arge and Opus, had traveled down through the same peoples that arrived at Delos. They had come to pay Iliathia, bowed and returned to easy delivery of childbirth. Arge and Opus, they say, arrived together with the gods themselves and were granted various honors by the Delians. The women collect donations for them and sing their names in the hymn of Olin and Lycia, composed for them. And the Delians have taught the islanders and Ionians to sing hymns to Opus and Art and to collect donations for them too. Olin, after arriving from Lycia, composed the other ancient hymns sung to Delos as well. In addition, they place the ashes from the thigh of the offerings that have been burned on the altar in Opus Arch, which is located behind the sanctuary of Artemis, facing east next to the banquet hall of the people of Chios. 
let that conclude my account of the Hyperboreans, for I shall not tell the story of Arbres, said to have been a Hyperborean, who went the whole world carrying on an arrow and eating nothing. But if there really are Hyperboreans, then there are also Hypernotians, and it makes me laugh when I see so many people nowadays drawing maps of the Earth, and not one of them giving an intelligent representation of it. They draw ocean flowing all around the whole Earth, portraying the Earth to be more perfectly circular, than if it were drawn with a compass and make in Asia the same size as Europe. I, however, will show the by a brief description of the actual size of the earth and what they should look like and how they should be drawn. So he then continues to draw his map and describe how the earth should look, which is worse. It's even worse. Here's a description of it. I'm showing it right now. As you, as you can see, it's not very accurate and uh but you can't really blame them this is 400 bc so they don't know they don't know what the world looks like they, they think there's one-eyed men in the north and there's griffins which is a, a mythical character with a lion's head on an eagle's body giant too that can guard gold for the for the kings and this is what they thought they thought this was true and factual they actually thought that there was dragons in the water in the oceans, so that if, uh, if, an, if, if ships or navies wanted to go too far into the sea, they would be attacked by these dragons. And that there was like these flying sirens that would come and kill you. And then there was these uh, mermaids everywhere too. Mermaids were evil. I also wanted to point out that I thought it was interesting that these people who have these religious views, these spiritual views on their local gods, would go to, to, to neighboring countries and get tribute from people who believed in them. It almost reminds me of what we see now with the Catholic Church. Maybe that's where the Catholic Church got the idea from. They would go around to the next country over and find people who worship the same deity as them and take offerings from them, bring them back to their country like a tax. This is from Pliny the Elder's Natural History. This is written in the first century, right around the 30s AD. And he writes here about the change of sex and double births. He writes, It is no fable that females may be turned to males, for we found it recorded in the annals, in the year when Pub Lucius Crassus and Cassius Longinus were consuls. There were a Cassium, a maid, who under her parents became a boy, and by the order of auspices, he was conveyed to a desert island. Lucius Mutinus reporteth that himself saw at Argos a person named Arsicon, who had been born the name of Arsica, and even had been married, but afterwards came to have a beard, and the general properties of a man, and thereupon married a wife. After the same sort, he saw Smyrna, a boy changed. I myself was an eyewitness that in Africa, Cossicus, citizens of Tisadra, was turned from woman to man upon the very marriage day. If a woman brings twins, it is rare for them to live, but either the mother dieth or one of the babes, if not both. But if the twins be of both sexes, it is rare for both of them to escape. Women grow old sooner than men, and they grow to the maturity more speedily than men. It is certain that a male child stirreth often in the womb, commonly more than the right side, whereas females incline to the left. <laughs> so Pliny, this is 400 years after Herodotus, gives his own description of a map. And he says, The beginning is that at the part of India, which turns to the south, it extends as far as Arabia, and the inhabitants of the Red Sea, under are, are comprised of the Gadardi, Perse, Carmini, and Lemony, Parthia, Aria, Susiana, Mesopotamia, Seleucia, surname Babylonia, Arabia, as far as Petre, Colsyria, Pelagium, Egypt, the lower coast, which are called Alexandria, of the maritime parts, Africa, all the towns of Cyrenica, Thaspis, Adrenium, and then he names like a bunch of places. And then he says, Westward passeth through the parts of Parthia, Persepolis, the nearest parts of Perseus, 
near Arabia, Judea. And he just keeps going and he names off all these countries. But like Herodotus, they don't know anything past India. They don't really know what's going on over there. They're not talking about China. They're not talking about Siberia. They're not talking about Mongolia. And this is 400 years after Herodotus. This is also after Alexander the Great went into India. So it just kind of shows you where their heads were at and where they thought of the world. They basically thought that Jerusalem was the center of the world. I mean, they really did. That's really where they put the location of the map. But that's all I wanted to talk about today. If you like this video, subscribe, like it, and share it, and give a comment on what you think. Goodbye.